Most of us have read articles by Christopher Birch. He has been sailing in England recently. He's talking about um, the Bahamas and cruising the Bahamas. And um, I will let he, Chris introduce himself because he has got a lot of information and he's going to talk of, discuss himself on the first couple of slides. Chris? Okay. And if we, I think we can, if we close that machine, because I hear something, an echo coming from it. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Terrific. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen here. Um, Okay. Um, everyone on Zoom, can you hear me okay? A thumbs up from anybody on Zoom, if you can hear me okay? A thumbs up, anybody on Zoom, can you hear me okay? Thumbs up, okay, terrific. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started then. Um, thank you all for uh, welcoming he me here uh, to your, your club. Uh, I have a stack of slides, a deck of slides, and then I'll have plenty of time to answer your questions afterwards. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, by means of introduction, I am uh, born, was born and raised in Boston, and I've lived here for the majority of my life. Back in 1985, I started my own marine service business on Long Wharf in Boston. And um, three years ago, I sold it to an employee uh, this guy here in the picture, and I'm happy to report that that business is still in operation today in that same location. I also uh, author the Boston Harbor Currents column in Points East magazine, and I serve as a contributing editor at Sail magazine, and that work for me is ongoing. Eight, uh, Ten years ago now, uh, my wife and I purchased this boat. Uh, she's a 1991 36 foot Morris Justine. Um, and for the first eight years that we owned her, we sailed her coastally in New England and in Atlantic Canada. And then three years ago with my business sold and our children out on their own, um, we sold our house here in the Boston area and moved aboard the boat full time. Since then, this is the track of where uh, our travels have taken us. We went first down to the Bahamas, um, coastally, and then back up through New England, uh, up to Nova Scotia, uh, Newfoundland, St. Pierre and Miquelon, uh, over to the Quebec province of uh, the Magdalene Islands, and then back down along the East Coast to the Bahamas uh, for a second winter down there. And then most recently, last summer, we sailed from the Bahamas up to Bermuda, over to the Azores, and then up into the south of England where the boat now sits uh, on the hard. Um, we have hopes of sailing, uh, putting the boat back in the water next spring and sailing for uh, Scandinavia. For the first uh, year of our voyage, we had this elderly dog aboard with us, a fellow named Bill. And um, he was, unlike most sailing dogs, was not trained to go to the bathroom on the foredeck. Um, and so what that meant for us is that we had to get him ashore morning and evening to go to the bathroom on the beach. And um, that goes to show that you can get from Boston to the Bahamas and back in day sales, because that's effectively what we had to do um, with this elderly dog. Um, and I think that's one of the, the, um, the real, uh, strong points of sailing to the Bahamas, one thing that makes it special is that you can get there from New England in day sails, as opposed to uh, other locations where you might have to sail offshore. Uh, sadly, we lost Bill um, when we were in uh, Nova Scotia. He died when we were in Halifax. And while we were heartbroken um, at the, when that happened, it did sort of change our sailing life considerably. And you can see we took full advantage and uh, crossed the Atlantic. So what I want to talk about this evening is the portion of our trip that was from New England down to the Bahamas and back to New England. I've done that trip three times. Uh, the first time was 
uh, back in 92, 93, and this red boat that you can see in the slides, uh, a 1991 Tartan 30 named Karina. 71 Tartan 30, right, uh, named Karina. And um, and then again, a couple years ago with my wife and, and that dog, um, and then just again last winter, um, this, this time last year, we were on our way down there. Uh, it really is a shockingly beautiful place, and it draws you back uh, for return visits. There are three ways to get from the uh, New England area to the Bahamas. A straight shot from the Cape Cod Canal to the Exumas um, is about 1,150 miles offshore, and you can do it in a, a straight shot. Uh, or you can take a coastal route uh, down to Norfolk, uh, and from there pick up the intercoastal waterway down to South Florida, and from there sail across to the Bahamas. Uh, uh, it's only 42 miles from Miami over to Bimini, so it's it's close. Or you could do a hybrid uh, approach where you sail when the weather's nice out in the ocean offshore, and then when the weather's not conducive for that, try to continue to make progress on the on the inland route. The different um, options have their different advantages and disadvantages. The offshore option clearly is the fastest way to get there. And it will also give you the opportunity probably to do the most sailing, or at least the most percentage of your time sailing as opposed to, to motoring. The uh, But the offshore option definitely also has its challenges, primarily in that it is offshore sailing. and um, and that requires uh, someone, a crew and a boat that are both prepared for that sort of thing. Uh, and then not only is it offshore sailing, but you're crossing the Gulf Stream and you're rounding Cape Hatteras. So it's challenging uh, offshore sailing. The intercoastal waterway option, the near coastal route down uh, to Florida, then across also has a lot of advantages. There's lots to see along the way. It's endlessly interesting. Um, there's urban, there's rural, there's uh, and everything in between. So it's um, it's a uh, it's an interesting route for sure. And you also have the opportunity to stop and rest. But there are challenges along that route. It is slow. Not only is it slow because you're stopping at night, but it's also slow because the intercoastal waterway zigs and zags. It snakes like a river uh, in many places, and so you're adding miles on. Um, it also requires a lot of motoring. Uh, in many places, the intercoastal waterway is a lot like the um, Cape Cod Canal. Um, and so you can envision why that would require motoring and not sailing. Other places you do get wide open sounds and bays where you, if with favorable wind, you'll be able to sail. But more often than not, you're going to be motoring on the intercoastal waterway. And there are a lot of bridges along the way. There are 74 opening bridges. Um, some of those open on demand, others are on a schedule, but either way, they are going to be slowing down your progress as you sort of navigate your way through those bridges. Uh, and there are also 85 fixed bridges uh, along the route, and those bridges have a air draft uh, a clearance of 64 feet. Uh, and if your mast is taller than 64 feet off the water, then this route just isn't an option for you. You won't make it under those bridges. If your mast is close to 64 feet off the water, then you might have to take them uh, take the tide into consideration as you pass through it, waiting for low tide. So you could see how that would definitely slow things down to adding to uh, the, the pace of travel uh, slowdowns. Shoaling is also a consideration. Uh, you the the deep water the channel where the deep water is on the intercoastal is constantly moving and so you have to pay close attention to where that is not only do you have to worry about running aground on the bottom but you also have to run, worry about running into the sides of the intercoastal because it's narrow uh, and so in a lot of ways it's like steering a car on the road as opposed to sailing offshore where you can put the boat on autopilot and go down below and make a sandwich. When you're on the intercoastal, you're paying constant attention. And that does get sort of exhausting or it can get exhausting. And there's a lot of traffic uh, on this route. Um, and uh, it's there's there's room for everyone to get through and for people to pass, but it's just one more element that needs to be negotiated as you're making your way down that inland route. 
the hybrid option, it seems to be, when I talk to people, this is what they anticipate they're going to do when they're making their way to the Bahamas. Why not, right? It's the best of both worlds. You can sail outside when the sailing's nice and not when it's not. The answer are the inlets. Um, the inlets aren't always where you want them to be. <laughs> uh, and so it makes it challenging to get in and out. Um, and the issue of wind against current in these inlets is a big deal. Um, sometimes it's unpleasant, sometimes it's treacherous, sometimes it's impassable uh, to, to navigate through a lot of the inlets. And, and in New England, we don't really deal with it, inlets as much as the rest of the East Coast of the U.S. does. Once you get south of New York, almost all the in, inland harbors and um, opportunities to move from the intercoastal to uh, the open ocean goes through a fairly narrow inlet, and most of those inlets have a lot of current. And so it can be really challenging. The, the idea of going from the inside to the outside for good weather works better in theory than it does in practice uh, is, is the way I would sum it up. I don't want to talk about the intercoastal the, the whole night, um, but I do think it's going to be a big part of a lot of people's experience um, sailing uh, to the Bahamas. Uh, and so I'm going to touch on just a couple other things. Um, these two resources, the 2024 uh, Cruising Guide by a guy named Bob 423, which is a book uh, you can get on uh, Kindle or in paper, and this app um, called Aquamaps, which you can load onto your phone or tablet, are excellent resources for navigating. They're almost mandatory resources for navigating your way down the intercoastal waterway. And the reason is, is that they're constantly being updated. So you can see that there's this blue uh, checkered line uh, in the app, and that's where the deep water is. And so what, they're do, what, what they do, uh, and without going into too much detail about how they do it, but they are constantly updating where that blue line is. So you know where the deep water is um, week by week. Um, as things change. And if long story short is if you go down the intercoastal without these resources available uh, at the helm, you're probably going to run aground. You know, if you're just following along on an avionics chart you're, or a paper chart uh, that's outdated, you're probably going to run aground. But with these resources, you, you, you probably aren't. And then one little aside that's interesting, you can see on the cover of this book, the, the uh, Cruising Guide book, there looks like something that might be maybe a crease in the lamination on the cover. It's not. What that is, is a, um, a rocket launch. So this was um, this sh shot was from uh, Cape Canaveral uh, or uh, Titusville, shot up from Titusville looking out at, over Cape Canaveral. And it's just an example of the kind of thing that you're going to experience on the intercoastal. There's just a lot of variety. Um, and with the Starlink rockets going up every week, you're more likely than not to see, to see a rocket when you're going by there. A few timing tips. Uh, so timing tip number one. Uh, when I, the first year that I sailed south to the Bahamas, I left November 1st. And I think it's a common rookie mistake that people make. They... Um, and the reality is what you get into weather like we have out here today. You're just cold the whole way down. And it doesn't have to be that way. My recommendation for, for people would be to leave New England around September 1st. And that way you're in short sleeves uh, the whole way down. And it's just a much more comfortable way of doing things. Now, you might be thinking, well, Birch, are you you're going to put me right into a hurricane, you know, if I leave here on September 1st? Well, the way I see it, the hurricane risk... Uh, is the same for us here in New England as it is pretty much all the way down the East Coast. And your, I mean, hurricanes come here too. Um, and the, the, your response to the threat of the hurricane, I think, is also the same. And that is that it makes sense to try to move your boat out of the way of the storm, whether it's north, south, or even west inland to try to get away from a storm. And there's something to be said for being on the boat already, to being underway, um, being focused on the weather, uh, paying attention, um, that you might well do better getting your boat out of the way of a storm if you're underway on board than if you're just waiting uh, for hurricane season to pass. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities on your way south 
to get inland, to get into protected uh, waters that are further away from the coast. So I think that you can safely navigate through the hurricane risk um, by leaving st and still leave on September 1st. Timing tip number two, get south of Norfolk prior to the end of the boat show. Uh, so that's like right now, the boat, to, boat show in Annapolis just ended. What happens is you when you start down the intercoastal waterway, you, you enter with a cluster of boats and you stay with them the whole way because everyone's going at about the same speed. Uh, and there's just a big pulse of boats, a big pulse in the population of boats that start on the day after the boat show because it's popular. People go to the boat show and then they continue on down to Florida or to the Bahamas. Uh, and so avoiding that day or that week really goes a long way to making the whole experience less crowded. You know, when the, when the intercoastal waterway is crowded, the fuel docks are crowded, the anchorages are crowded, everything gets kind of crowded. And it, and for the most part, it's not that, that's not the experience, but there are some bubbles of these big pulses of boats that go down. Another one is November 1st. A lot of people, a lot of insurance carriers stipulate that you can't go south of Norfolk either outside or inside uh, until November 1st uh, because of the hurricane risk that we were just talking about. And my advice would be to either um, try to negotiate something with your insurance company or ignore that advice and just go ahead um, of that deadline. Timing tip number three, get south in the Bahamas early. I think what happens is people get to the Bahamas. It's been a long ride down from New England and they're exhausted and they're also really thrilled to be there. And so they just want to slow down and stop and, you know, take in every anchorage, every town um, and stop the frantic pace of pushing south. And that's all well and good, except for the fact that in the Bahamas, the northern Bahamas are cold, windy, and wet in the dead of winter, more often than not. I think what people fail to realize is that the Bahamas is a big country. It's almost 600 miles north to south, uh, which is similar in distance to Montreal to Richmond, Virginia. And just like uh, between Montreal and Richmond, Virginia, there's a great temperature gradient north to south. Um, and what I saw when we were down there over and over and over again are these cold fronts sweeping through uh, the Bahamas and they would get halfway through the chain of islands and stall. And that meant that the northern Bahamas, places like Abaco, were in uh, 60 degrees, 30 knots of wind and rain. And the southern Bahamas, it was 80 degrees, sunny, with a 15-knot trade wind out of the east. Uh, and that, that pattern repeated itself over and over. Now, the flip side of this situation is also true. And that is that it gets hot in the southern Bahamas in the spring and the early summer and late winter. Um, and so the obvious solution is to visit the northern Bahamas on the way home and not on the way down because it's cooler up there in, in the spring. Timing tip number four, Thanksgiving at the Bahama Land and Sea Park in Exuma. Uh, so this is uh, at Wardrick Wells in the, in the Exumas. And um, if you happen to be in the area, they throw a really dynamite free Thanksgiving dinner for all the sailors who are sailing past. Uh, they encourage you to bring a side dish and maybe some drinks. Um, but you get the opportunity to sort of mix and mingle with the people that work there and also the other boaters that are there. And that's just... It's just a nice thing to be able to do when you might otherwise be kind of alone on a, on a holiday. Timing tip number five, Christmas in Georgetown. So Georgetown is um, the center of the sailing universe in the Bahamas. And it is for good reason. There's a lot of resources there for the boat and for the crew. There's a protected harbor and it's a beautiful place. Uh, there's also free uh, fresh water and an international airport. It, the list goes on and on of reasons why Georgetown's a great uh, place for the visiting sailor. But um, the downside with Georgetown is that it gets crowded. And a lot of people think, ah, you know, I just want to go to Georgetown, get my laundry done and get back out because it's just so crowded. There's so many boats. 
But the way you can beat that is by getting there before the rest of the boats do. Then you have all the benefits and none of the downsides. A little bit about the demographics uh, of the Bahamas. Population is about 400,000 people. And for point of comparison, the summer population of Martha's Vineyard is about 200,000 people. So you have that vast 600 miles sprawl of islands over 700 islands uh, and only two Martha's Vineyards worth of people on the whole place. So it's a really sparsely populated country. Uh, and to make that even more pronounced, most of those people live in the two small cities of Nassau and Freeport Grand Palma. Uh, the rest of the country is really sparsely populated. All of the 700 islands, only 30 of them uh, have settlements on them. Um, and there are a lot, a lot of the rest are privately owned, um, but m the vast majority of the rest are uh, uninhabited and available for you to visit. Um, yeah. So this slide was difficult for me to put together because I've made some really gross generalizations here, but I think it's helpful to, to think of the Bahamas in these terms. Bimini, the islands of Bimini, Nassau, and Grand Bahama are uh, generally speaking urban. It's a small population, so they're small urban centers, but that's where the urban centers are. And it, you know, it cuts both ways. It's the good and the bad that comes with urbanity is going to be found there. It's also where the cruise ships tend to congregate. It's the part of the Bahamas that are closest to Florida. Uh, Abaco and Eleuthera are popular with the non-sailing vacationers and also the second homeowners. And what you'll find in these two island groups are a lot of the amenities that, that those visitors would like. So restaurants, bars, uh, there's a, a farm on a Luther where you can get fresh vegetables. Um, and so there are more people in these islands and also more amenities. And of course, all those amenities that are available to the visiting sailors are also available to the, I mean, to the visiting um, tourists are also available to the visiting sailors. And then everything else in the Bahamas, I would describe as remote. Uh, one example of how remote some of these places are, uh, there's a, a, a section, of, uh, a, a province in the Bahamas, which is like akin to one of our states in the U.S., uh, called the Ragged Islands. So it's not just an island chain. It's not just an island. It's a whole province in the Bahamas. Total population, 78 people. Uh, it's remote. A couple of photos that show some um, examples, the cruise ships there in uh, Nassau uh, and in uh, Abaco, you can see a little bit more going on with houses and people sailing. This is um, Hope Town, also in Abaco. Here we are enjoying some of those cocktails at those bars uh, in uh, Abaco. And then remote, you leave that behind. Uh, you have beaches, you know, to yourself in the Exumas. Here we are, Shroud Key uh, in the Exumas. This is uh, Wardrick Wells, where I was talking about Thanksgiving uh, in the Exumas. Cat Island, uh, there's a little uh, hermitage there at the high point, actually in all of the Bahamas, which is a crazy little thing, but Otherwise, those islands are pretty remote. This is down in the Raggeds. Um, and uh, that's a, a that's our dog and that's a visiting sailor. Um, and otherwise the islands are, are empty. Crooked Island. So where to go? I would, my advice for people when they go down to the Bahamas would be to sort of start in the Exumas. It gets you out of the, gets you south, away from the cold weather in the north, early in the season, uh, and then if you, uh, and it's sort of the quintessential Bahama experience. I think it's some of the most beautiful uh, areas in the Bahamas, and it's not quite uh, as uh, remote as some of the other remote places. There are some amenities for the boat and the crew there, uh, but it has that that vibe to it that feels very much like the the the, the remote sections of the Bahamas. And then if you want more amenities um, and for the, for the boat and the crew, then work your way towards Eleuthera and Abaco. 
If you want more remote, then work your way south and east towards Haiti. A couple of um, tips on aids to navigation uh, or cartography. Here in New England, I'm a big fan of, of Navionics. In most places in the world, I'm a big fan of Navionics. And I also certainly use the MapTech chart books like a lot of people do in these waters. But in the Bahamas, I find these two go-to cartography sources to be inferior to the Explorer chart book uh, uh, charts, which are just a totally different cartography. Uh, I won't bore you with how it's all amassed, but it, it's but it is a, a different cartography. And then that cartography is replicated in the CMAP chips for your chart plotter. Uh, and so my recommendation in the Bahamas would be CMAP chips for the chart plotter and the Explorer chart books. One thing that's also cool about the Explorer chart books is that they um, they build a, a cruising guide right into the books. So you it's both a cruising guide and a chart book all in one, uh, which is which is nice. It's an arid climate in the Bahamas, uh, and this came as something of a surprise to me when I was when I first got there. A lot of the islands have no groundwater, and that has a big impact on the history of the country, uh, and especially those islands. A lot of uh, imperial powers came through. They took a look at the Bahamas. They said, "No thanks." And you know, there's there are not many places that you can say that about in the world that have no human history. Um, and that's just because there's no water. You couldn't farm. You can't really live there with no water. Um, and so that is a, a, a pretty big part of the explanation for why it's as rural as it is. The El Nino-La Nina cycle uh, is a, a big factor on the weather pretty much everywhere in the world. But I think it's particularly pronounced in the Bahamas. And I've been there in both the El Nino seasons and the La Nina seasons. And what you find, generally speaking, is that during El Nino, it's going to be windy, it's going to be cool, and it's going to be pretty good sailing. Uh, the downside for the El Nino years is it's going to be harder to get around in your dinghy. It's not going to be as easy to be at the beach. And the weather systems tend to come through and spin uh, direction, uh, wind, wind direction, uh, with great regularity. So you constantly have to move the boat to find a protected harbor um, because the wind direction is changing. As opposed to the La Nina seasons, when the, the wind is going to be lighter, it's going to be hotter, and it's going to be buggier at night. Um, and what you'll also find is that the wind is more consistently just out of the east. Those trade winds coming out of the east during the La Nina years, which means you won't have to move your boat. Uh, you can just stay in an anchorage almost indefinitely. Um, and that's also going to be easier getting around in the dinghy, and it's going to be easier getting and uh, enjoying the beaches. So it's you know very different experience in the different years, um, but that's how I would sum it up. Critters. So you'll see a lot of these uh, little lizards. They're everywhere. And the bigger lizards, these are the iguanas, uh, can be over two feet long. Uh, rays, turtles, dolphin, sharks. Uh, this is a nurse shark in this photo, um, but we also saw hammerhead sharks and tiger sharks and reef sharks and sand sharks. There are a lot of sharks um, down there, and I suspect there are probably just as many sharks up around here. It's just that you can't see them quite as well here as you can down there because the water is so clear. And I think the way I would sum up my experience with the sharks is, is to consider them a lot like uh, squirrels in the woods. They're everywhere, but they're kind of skittish. You know, you, get, you, get, you approach one, you get kind of close, and they run off. Um, and so they didn't really cause much in the way of problems for us uh, at all, um, but they were omnipresent. They were just everywhere you, you look, there are sharks. One thing that was interesting about these nurse sharks is they like to go right underneath the boat for the shade. Um, and sometimes they would also like to congregate right underneath our galley sink drain for the scraps when we're doing dishes. 
So you look around, there's nothing going on. You dive over the side for a swim and you swim back towards the swim ladder and there's, you know, the shark right there under the boat. So, yeah. Um, and fish. So this is the Thunderball Grotto uh, near Staniel Key in the Exumas. And um, this is where the movie Thunderball, the James Bond movie Thunderball was filmed. And it, it's one of many places where you can go and snorkel and see fish like this. So they, it's a great place for, for that sort of activity. Uh, so good news, that's the only video in this presentation. So if you were feeling a little sick to your stomach, it's over. Um, but I did think that that blue and yellow fish was a nice one to include. And not much else. That's one thing that's surprising about it. You'll see a lot in the Bahamas of everything that I just showed you, but you don't see that much else in terms of biodiversity. It's just a fairly narrow biome. And I don't exactly know why. Um, there are birds in the Bahamas, but there are not that many of them. And even seabirds. And then, and what really hit this point home to me is we got back to the Bahamas, I mean, back to Florida from the Bahamas, and it felt like we were entering like a bird, you know, kingdom. There are birds everywhere. And it's just normal Florida situation. But what it meant is that there were very few birds, you know, that we've been living with all winter. So it felt like there were a lot of birds in Florida. Marinas versus moorings versus anchoring. Uh, there are marinas in the Bahamas. Uh, there are a few moorings also, but for the most part, you're going to be anchoring uh, in the Bahamas. And that uh, is good and bad. Um, the good news is that anchoring is free uh, and the holding is good. In most places, you get this nice soft sort of pillowy sand, sometimes with a little bit of grass mixed into it, sometimes not. And when it's not good, you're going to be able to read about it in those uh, notes in the, in the chart book. That will tell you where the, the spots where your holding's not going to be good. But it's pretty easy to figure out because you can see the bottom so well. So you know exactly what's going on, uh, which is unique. <laughs> uh, well, it's it's different uh, compared to here. Uh, so here we are in, you know, 15 feet of water. And you can see every link of chain. You can see every blade of grass. And you can see what your anchor's doing. Um, so it, it's it, in that way, it's a pretty good place uh, to anchor. Um but, you know, there's no electricity, there's no water when you're on, on anchor, and you can't step off the boat and walk into town, you know, so that you, the realities of living on anchor are a big part of, of what you have to anticipate when you're down there. The Bahamian people, I think when we look back on our time down there, we're going to think, we're going to remember most fondly of all the different things that we enjoyed, the, the Bahamian people, we made some great friends. Uh, down there. And we found them all to be really, all the people that we met to be welcoming. Um, and it's an interesting, eclectic sort of mix of these expats who have relocated down there and people that have been born and raised there for generations. And it's it's very harmonious. And and um, I think it's really one of the strengths of the, of the island group are the people that live there. Um, you do read about crime uh, in the... <clears throat> In the U.S. press, there's there have been stories about crime in the Bahamas, but from what I can tell, that is isolated to Nassau uh, and maybe some Grand Bahama. But I think primarily, from what I understand, it's one particular neighborhood in Nassau, which is, you know, it, not not great for that neighborhood. But um, the rest of the country really did feel really safe. Um, we never locked our dinghy. No one else locked their dinghy. We never locked our boat. Uh, and frankly, we just felt safer in the Bahamas than we did in Florida. Sailboats dominate the seascape. So uh, there aren't many opportunities to buy fuel down there. And I think that's a big factor for limit limiting uh, the number of powerboats you see down there, which are constantly in, in need of fuel. Um, and also powerboats like to go to marinas. And so uh, if your life on the anchor, it's, it's true here, it's true there. Um, more often than not, power boats uh, opt out. The sailing community. So it's a it's an eclectic group uh, of people that you'll meet down there. Old people, young people, people on all sorts of different boats and all sorts of different boat, boating budgets. Um, but the one thing that everyone has in common is that everyone got to wherever they are on their own boat. And that's a really powerful common denominator. 
Uh, and so it's it's easy to sort of bond with these people, even though you think you really don't have all that much in common with them otherwise. And you might not, it might be harder elsewhere. Um, and I think it's probably true most places that sailors congregate, but I think it's particularly true in the Bahamas because it's developed this reputation of being sort of cruiser friendly and people go out of their way to live up to those expectations. Um, and then there's also some sort of organized um, structure to it that, that helps enable the, the um, socializing uh, and, and other sort of support that you can get from the other sailors. And a big part of that is the morning cruisers net. So in a lot of places, Georgetown and others, there'll be a, a, a VHF net on, on the radio in the morning. And it's there's a moderator and it's well organized and there's a, an agenda. Um, but basically, it's sailors helping sailors. So if someone has a problem, someone else might be able to help them solve that problem. And um, and then there are other you know things scheduled. Like in this photo, you can see people are congregating for beach yoga. Uh, but there's other stuff. There's beach volleyball, and there's kids' events on the beach, and there's bonfires, and there's there's a lot of stuff. You can easily opt out of all of it if you're not into it. But um, it's it, it's it's an easy thing to opt into if if you're if you want to. Preparing your boat. So I think it makes a lot of sense to try to get your boat ready for a trip to the Bahamas or really anywhere before you leave as much as you possibly can because it's much easier to do boat work as a home game as opposed to an away game. When you're at home, you have a shipping address. You have a vehicle. You, you know who can, you can call to help you with this and that and the other on the boat. You know where the supplies are that you might need um, for a project. Um, and you might have additional shop space or tools that you don't carry on the boat. Soon as you leave, all of that's gone. And it makes it a lot harder to accomplish anything uh, in terms of a repair on the boat. So most of us know like what the weak spots are, the little bits and pieces on the boat that we might be worried about a little bit systems wise. If there's any doubt in your mind about the, the how bulletproof any given system is, sort it out before you leave, get it there because you don't want to deal with it later on. You, The people that have a bad time in the Bahamas are the people whose boat's broken. Everyone else is having a good time. But if your boat's broken, it, it can stay that way for months. Because no one's going to, you know, there's that you just don't have the infrastructure to solve problems. Provisioning. Load up in Florida. Um, the groceries are expensive and you're not going to have the sort of selection that you want, uh, not just groceries, but all dry goods. Um, and it makes sense. Everything's coming in by boat to these small islands and it's expensive to do that. And so it really pays to load up in Florida with all the um, dry good things that you might need, paper towel, toilet paper, beer, wine, and canned food. Um, because once you get to the Bahamas, it's going to be hard to find. You're not going to find necessarily the quality or the, or the brands that you're used to or looking for. And um, it's going to be really expensive. And it, it's a little bit tricky for people because you're not used to shopping in these sorts of quantities. You're going away for four or six months for the winter. You're not used to buying paper towel in that sort of quantity, but it pays to do the math and figure out what your rate of consumption is on all these different non-perishable items and then load up the boat. And, you know, I, uh, I know there's not, there's not so much space on the boats. We're on a 36 foot boat. There's not a ton of space, but it's, it's worth pushing the envelope a little bit and loading up as much as you can um, because it's going to be hard to reprovision once you're out there. <clears throat> uh, a few thoughts on a good tender. You got to be happy with the tender you have uh, because you're going to be using it a lot and you really want something that's going to be reliable. For us, we found oars to be reliable. Okay, uh, so coming towards the end here, sailing the Bahamas, uh, pros and cons. Pros, I would say the Bahamian people, the world-class uh, clarity of the seawater and the beaches. One thing that was interesting that happened when we were down there is that the uh, the Europeans tend to have this habit early on in their 
in their um, careers of taking a year off and going sailing and doing the Atlantic loop, or they'll leave Northern Europe and they'll sail down the Canary Islands, through the Caribbean, through the Bahamas, where we are, and then back up, back home to Northern Europe via the, the Azores or uh, Iceland. And so we met a lot of these people they, coming through on their boats. And over and over and over again, we talked to these people who had just been in, you know, Beckwe and St. Lucia and the Virgin Islands and Antigua. And then they get to the Bahamas and they're like, whoa, you know, this the water here, the beaches here is 10 times more beautiful than any other place in the Caribbean. And like, no one ever told me it's like a secret. And it's so it's not just me. It's like it, it, other people are saying the same thing. Um, so it, it really is there. It's amazing water. Uh, an abundance of empty anchorages, spectacular sailing, snorkeling, fishing, welcoming cruising community. It's easy to get there. It's accessible uh, from here. And it's thrilling to skip a cold New England winter. Cons, uh, scarcity of fresh water, scarcity of fresh fruit, vegetables, and meat, scarcity of parts and services for the boat, scarcity of fine dining, and it can be cool and windy. So one thing uh, that I didn't mention earlier is that this the, the fresh water thing is a really big issue in the Bahamas. It's It can be... Um, next to impossible to load up on water in a lot of places. And when I, the first year I was down there on my Tartan 30, we had a 26 gallon water tank and we were just constantly running out of water. And, and it was a, a big, it was our biggest problem by far. And we were doing crazy things like borrowing a car and going to the airport with jugs to just to get water, you know? And uh, it's, you know, you're not used to thinking this way, but it's the reality of the situation down there. And a lot of the places you, you pay for water, when you take it, when you can find it, uh, just out of the tap by the gallon. A lot of places, the water quality is not so great. Um, and uh, in many places, it's just not existing. And so a water maker is a, is a huge um, thing to think about adding uh, to a boat that's going down there. They're expensive, but it's, it's, it's something to it, definitely worth considering. And then the other thing that, that, it comes down to when you're down there is that if, if you're going to be on anchor and you're going to be running your water maker and your fridge and your freezer and all this other stuff, you're going to need power. You know, you're going to need some way to keep your batteries charged. And the obvious answer is, is solar. You don't want to be running your engine all the time because that's just annoying for you and everyone else. And, and because fuel is scarce. Uh, so solar is the obvious answer. It's what people go to down there. Uh, generally speaking, all the boats down there. And um, what you find is that everyone wishes they had more solar. You know, they, everyone comes back with more solar than than they than they had. An interesting thing about solar is that your so, your solar array in the Bahamas will be less productive in December than your same solar array in Boston in June. And it's counterintuitive because you think your solar array is going to do great down in the Bahamas because uh, it's the tropics, right? Sunny, it's kind of great for solar. Not true. Um, the length of day has a huge impact on the productivity you're going to get out of your solar array. And in this, in June, in New England, we have a very long day. Down in the Bahamas in December, the day is a lot shorter. It's longer than it is in Boston in December, but it's still relatively short. Uh, and so what that means and people aren't used to that. New Englanders aren't used to that. I wasn't used to that when I saw it. I was like, why aren't the solar panels working quite as well as they used to, you know? It's, it just has to do with lower sun angles because we're not used to, you know, using our solar panels on our boats in December here. Um, and the answer, the solution is, is twofold. One, more solar, more solar. And two, um, orienting the panels more towards the um on the on the vertical than on the horizontal because the solar the sun angle is lower. Okay, um, my top three anchorages in the Bahamas. Number three, Georgetown in the Exumas. I think a lot of veteran sailors would be surprised by this veteran Bahamas sailors because, like I said earlier, people are like in and out of Georgetown. But when I the first time I got there, I was blown away by how physically beautiful the place is. It's a gorgeous place, and it does have 
all the amenities for the boat. And it does have a big protected anchorage. And so if you, if, if it's not crowded, uh, it can be a really spectacular place. Number two, Lee Stocking Island in the Exumas. Uh, so this is only uh, 30 or 40 miles north of um, Georgetown. And it's, I think it's, um, what you notice in this picture is that I'm looking down on the boats in the anchorage, I think one of which is mine. And uh, this place has a little bit more elevation than a lot of the other islands, which makes it special. It also has great walking trails and beaches and everything else. It's just one of those places that's a little bit uh, uh, better than a lot of the other neighboring places. You will see in this photo, there are not a lot of houses. And that's not what makes the special because that's true of most islands. You know, that's, they're mostly all uninhabited, but it is, it does give you a flavor of what it's like to sort of to be there and these islands just run along empty uh, for miles. And number one, uh, anywhere in the Bahama Land and Sea Park. So this is where, uh, where I talked about having Thanksgiving dinner with the, the, the park staff. And uh, it's somehow the Bahamian government just did did a great thing by setting this particular maybe 40 square miles aside for the Bahamian people and all the rest of us to enjoy um, because it's 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 you know they've taken um, the clarity of the water and the anchorages and the beauty the natural beauty of the place and they just turned it up to 11 and uh, at the same time they've protected it there's no fishing allowed and other ways they've protected it so that it will stay as pristine as it is that's it yeah so i'm happy to answer, answer a question yeah 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 it spent some time on the foredeck um but we towed it um the vast majority of the way that boat tows really well my father built that boat back in 1999 and since then between me and him we've towed it uh over 40,000 miles uh towed and rode it yeah so it's got a lot of miles on it and uh it's a great little boat 44 pounds so it's really easy to lift uh 44 pounds yeah it's Chris, can you repeat the questions because we can't hear them online the question was uh they wanted to know about our dinghy uh the red yeah. dinghy that you saw in some of the photos yeah, and the design is the Tetra, um, and uh, I write about it extensively in, well, in Point Peace a lot, but also on the website you can see in the slide here. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, Steve Redman design, and um, it's uh, it ha doesn't have very much in the way of load carrying capability. So it's, uh, you know, in the same way that it, like a kayak wouldn't, but it tows really well and it rows really well. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've, we've been really happy with that boat. Nothing. It just it goes along like nothing. I get it up on the on the on the uh, on the stern wave. Uh, get you know get it the right distance behind. It's just surfing down down the stern wave behind. It doesn't slow us down at all. Yeah, and it, you can you're just like with your pinky. I mean, there's just nothing to it back there. Plywood. Yeah. No plywood yeah okumi plywood yeah uh, yes sir um talking about draft i got two questions about draft yeah welcome to tell me i see them so the yep. air draft is a hard number 64 feet yep. period yep death draft is sort of a softer limit yeah you're going to start to be miserable with more than how much you're at there are regular um, barges that go through. So commercial- Chris, can you repeat the question? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, yep, yep. Uh, how much draft do you need in the intercoastal and how much draft do you need in the Bahamas? Um, how Or what's gonna be uncomfortable if you exceed it? Uh, and my answer is that there's commercial traffic um, uh, that runs through the intercoastal waterway all the time, big barges that are pushed by um, tugboats that go down eight feet. And they really do a good job of blasting that channel. If, you know, if they run aground, they just keep going. They make it eight feet if it's not. And so they they do open it up in that way. The problem is is fine is knowing where that eight foot spot is. And all the tug all the uh, you know the tug operators know where it is. And they they're not always in the middle of the channel. The deep water is not always there. And so more than um, so I guess I guess eight feet would be my answer. Uh, which is a bigger number than you'll hear from a lot of people. But the reason is that you, 
that these resources are now available to us in a way that they just weren't 10 years ago with the uh, Aquamaps app and the Bob 423 um, system for tracking where the deep water is. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then in the Bahamas, I, you know, you could go um, closer to the beach if your boat's shallower, but it's a, you can also do fine with an eight foot draft there. Um, I think there, you'd be limited where you could go, but there are a lot of boats there with deep draft. And again, a lot of commercial traffic that comes through that's, that's uh, deeper. Um, but I wouldn't consider it a limit, a limiting factor. I've, I found it to be much less of an issue than people make it out to be in terms of like constantly running along and like five and a half feet of water. Um, so yeah. 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 Uh, people might not want to sail the 1100 miles down to the shoulder. Yeah. Now, how about, uh, chartering a boat in Nassau mm -hmm. and, going down. I've been there twice and probably I would say down to stand your feet would be as far as you'd want to go because it's probably the most beautiful spot there too. And you, you don't see a lot of charter boats there. Uh, but it's a way to do it. Yep. And easy. Yep. So the question for you guys online is what about um chartering a boat? Um is is that a viable option in the Bahamas? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, you're limited to where you could pick a boat up. Um, and from what I can tell, it's Nassau or Marsh Harbor in the uh, uh, in the Abacos. Um, and there might be others that I'm unaware of, but they're, they're, the outfits are kind of few and far between other than out of those two um, bases. Um, so Chris, yeah, I mean, following up on that, I, I actually did yeah. charter a boat out of Marsh Harbor, as you said. Yep. It was too early, it was cold, it was unpleasant, lots of yep. storms. Yep. But the one tip they gave us on chartering there, because I had a, a four and a half foot keel, so so called shallow keel. Some yep. of the harbors were three foot, and they told us if we ran aground, don't bother calling and just wait for a high tide. And I wonder if you can just expand on that thought. Yeah. So the question was, if you do run aground, what to do about it? Um, he got it, this gentleman um, chartered a boat in uh, Marsh Harbor in the Abacos um, with a four and a half foot draft. And the advice that the charter outfit gave him uh, is that if you do run aground, just wait for high tide and you'll and you'll get off. Um, but yeah, sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not. I mean, if you run aground at high tide, that's not going to be true. Um, okay. And so. Um, I think some of the same precautions that we would have to take um, and the same solutions that we would have to take here in New England apply down there. Um, the, there. The tide's a lot less in the Bahamas than it is around here. You know, many places you're only talking about two or three feet. Um, and so the tide is 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 um, not going to get you out of a lot of trouble quickly. Um, and in some places, usually places where the charter fleets operate, you uh, there are going to be more in terms of the way of services that could help you if there's a problem. So the tow boat operators and that sort of thing. Um, but I, yeah, I don't really have much more to add on that. So Chris, the other thing I would add is that I, I we looking at the charts, it would say like say six foot, and I thought oh, I'm in good shape, and then there'd be a coral head that's three foot up. Yeah. And so we continually worried about coral heads. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it, a, a lot of that comes down to the cartography, I think. I think it makes a lot. Oh, the, the question for all of you is what about um, uh, coral heads and what about places where it says it's six feet on the chart, but really it's only three feet because there's a coral head um, there. There are areas that they um, will set aside in the chart and and specify and say that these areas you're going to have to use visual um, uh, navigation as you go through because um, coral heads are growing and, and they could be an obstacle for you. Um, and, and that's sort of a unique feature that we're certainly not used to around here. But I think a big part of the answer there is using the right cartography. And so if you stick with the Explorer charts and the CMAP charts and stay away from the Navionics and the Lighthouse charts, um, then you're you're they're gonna there are predetermined routes on those charts that are gonna take you in safe alleys where you're not likely to bump into anything. 
um, and they're drawn they're drawn like magenta lines on on the on the chart. So to go from here to here to here um, would be. And I found that when you were on those magenta lines, you didn't run into any problems. So yeah, you, if you go off into um, some of the far corners of the Bahamas uh, or, or off into the corners of the chart where not a lot of people are, you don't really know what's there quite as much as you would around here. You can see it oftentimes, and that's unique compared to being around here. You can see uh, a coral head um, and, you know, and, and you learn the difference between what a coral head looks like and what a patch of seagrass looks like. And you can tell a lot about the depth of the water by looking at it. But I wouldn't trust my eyes necessarily. Um, uh, you know, they had to back in the day. Um, but I would um, try to pay attention to, to uh, staying on those well-established magenta uh, courses that are all over the place to take you safely from point A to point B. Yeah, does that, does that make sense? Okay. okay. Uh, size of your battery bank and the size of your panels. Size of the battery bank, size of the panels is the is the question on our boat. We have um, the first year I went down there I had no solar panels on that Tartan Thirty. Of course, I didn't have anything that required power either on that simple boat back then. Um, now uh, we have a three hundred amp hour lithium bank, and we have seven hundred amp uh, seven hundred watts of, of solar power. Hmm. What do we use for the underwater camera for the videos? Question. Uh, a GoPro. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, people put those to work much more than we did. For the most part, we weren't experts on it, but yeah, <laughs> that's what did that. Yeah. Anything else? <clears throat> Any opinion on, on uh, wind versus solar? Yeah. The question is any opinion on wind versus solar? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of wind. I find that it's not, uh, nearly as productive, especially as solar's gotten better, wind just hasn't, uh, and it makes a racket. Uh, so I, I find it to be really noisy and unpleasant, both for me and for my neighbors. And so, um, I, I'd much prefer to go down the path of solar than, than wind. And I think that's true. You see very little wind, uh, wind machines down there. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question has to do with uh, how we deployed our solar. We had a somewhat unorthodox approach um, in that we had um, semi-permanent uh, flexible panels that we used on our boat, and we could can take them all down and, and take them all away um, and stow them, um, which to me uh, is valuable. Um, because I, I love the idea of being able to get rid of them during a storm uh, and for uh, some offshore work. We also towed a, um, a water a hydro generator, um, which we used offshore. So that was another way that we could generate power. Um, but in practice, we ended up finding a good place for the panels aboard the boat. And for us, um, it worked out to be very effective to drape them over the lifelines, um, which isn't really all that usual a solution. Um, but again, with the low sun angles, we have each one of the panels had its own regulator, so we could keep track of what they were doing. And our panels that were looking out at the horizon, draped over our lifelines, same panel, identical panel, was also up on top of the bimini, facing straight up at the sky. And that panel that was above the bimini, facing straight up at the sky, did great from one, 11 to 1. And then it just it was done, pretty much. Whereas those panels that faced out to the side kept cranking it away. So it was like the tortoise and the hare, you know? And by the end of the day, those panels that were facing effectively the wrong way uh, were, were doing a better job of, of producing power. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, could we use this configuration offshore? Yeah, it took a little bit of work to get, get it that way, um, but we have, uh, we, we found a system uh, along the short of it is we found a system where we were able to pull the cabling back uh, along the rail uh, to plugs in the, uh, on the aft end of the boat uh, where we plugged them in. And we did all the way across the Atlantic. We ended up keeping everything deployed. We never encountered stormy weather where we felt it was prudent to take it in. So they're great panels. They're, they're um, 
Sunware Solar is the brand and they're a German panel. It's a really high quality panel. Um, and uh, we found that we were able to to keep them keep them running and yeah. Yeah. Yes, one more question. But, uh, Pete decided to come by. Yeah. How was uh, how was shipping and swaps during and that kind of stuff? Like are those resources available? Do you need licenses or just kind of yeah. crawl? Yeah. So the question had to do um with uh fish and meat. Meat's hard to come by, um, but fish is readily available if you're willing to go and get it. Uh, in the park that I mentioned in the Exumas, you're not um, permitted to uh, fish, uh, but in most other areas you are. And when you when you arrive in the Bahamas, you're, you uh, have to obtain a cruising permit. It's the part of the process of checking into the country and it costs $300. And with that cruising permit comes a fishing permit, whether you want it or not. So as soon as you get there, you've gained the, the appropriate permit um, for fishing. And there are rules um, about uh, spear fishing. Uh, when you go diving and spear and fishing for fish that way, you're not allowed to use the, um, the spear fishing guns that have triggers. You have to use the ones that are like a slingshot. Um, and I don't, I don't quite know what the, 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 the rationale behind that is, but yeah. Um, a lot of people down there did a lot of fishing. We didn't do a lot of fishing. We did some, but that wasn't our strong suit. <laughs> yeah. Anything else, uh, on, online? No. Okay. Well then I think we probably have it about wrapped up. Yeah. I've got one question. I have oh, oh, sorry. We have one more, one more question. Okay, no. Wait, oh, another question. I'm sorry. Yep. Go, ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh Communications, uh, other than around the Bahamas, is that done by cell? Do they have cell phones? Do they have shortwave radio or HF? How the hell's that done? Okay, yeah, good question. The question was, how do we communicate uh, from the boat? Um, cell phone service is pretty good down there in most places. Um, but in places where it's <coughs> not, you have you have nothing. Uh, we added Starlink um, to the boat, and that. You know, solve the problem completely. Um, so if you're if you're if you wanted um, connectivity all the time everywhere, then Starlink would be the one and only solution, I guess, or a single sideband. Um, but uh, cell service is good; it's better than you'd think. Okay. Thank you, Chris. 